evening everybody and uh, this is uh, welcome uh, to this last lecture in the series of this webinar conducted by i am mumbai chapter this seminar is given by dr pranesh sen gupta who is a leading expert in this geology and uh, he is a geologist by profession and he has done excellent work in studying minerals and mineralogy and uh, he basic his experience goes with the how the detect uranium in the various part of the country and his vast experience behind him he is going to give this lecture prior to this lecture i am uh, we are uh, uh, dr vivekanand kain will give a short introduction of iu thank you over to dr Welcome to this event organized by the Indian Institute of Metals, Mumbai Chapter. I am Vivekanand Kane, Chairman of the Mumbai Chapter of the Indian Institute of Metals. I am going to give you a glimpse of the Indian Institute of Metals and specifically the typical activities that Mumbai Chapter organizes for its members. The idea for the institute was conceived in 1945. and a small group of uh, metallurgical professionals based at bombay that time they had formed the bombay metallurgical society played a key role so from 1945 several people people including bombay metallurgical society started working on this idea of formation of a national level of institute the institute was inaugurated in 1947 with uh, 42 founder members and 11 council members the institute was inaugurated on 29th of december 1947 by shri shyama prasad mukherjee minister for industry and supply at that time shri jahangir gandhi was the first president and dr dara p antia was the first honorary secretary of the institute and the office space at calcutta was provided by the house of tatas Although the institute was inaugurated in 1947, the seed for that was uh, through this council, which was formed earlier, and the first organizational meeting was held on 24th of February 1946. Therefore, the Indian Institute of Metals in February 2021. will be starting its 75th year celebrations uh, at that time several international institutes including the institute for metals uh, uk and the institute of iron and steel uk they advised that india should not go for separate institutes for each sub topic in the field of metallurgy and materials therefore right from that stage the scope of the institute included all the topics such as mineral beneficiation extraction of materials fabrication of materials heat treatment finishing as well as practical and theoretical aspects of metallurgy of all ferrous and non ferrous metals and alloys including ceramics and other disciplines and technologies which come in the broad field of metallurgy and materials the vision of the institute includes increased global visibility for the iim cooperating with the related government departments on policy formulations focused services to be provided to industry with higher degree of industry specific interaction as well as career development and encouraging young metallurgists the annual general body of the indian institute of metals is typically held at the end of july of every year and so last month itself we had dr amol gokhale taking over as the president of the institute as i told you institute has three divisions through which it operates these divisions are ferrous division metal sciences division and non ferrous division this division is chaired by shri tv narendran who is also the vice president of the institute 
Metal Sciences Division. The chairman is Dr. Samir Kamat. He is the vice president of the institute. And Mr. Satish Pai is the chairman of the non ferrous division and vice president of the institute. The Indian Institute of Metals has more than 10,000 members. Transactions of the Indian Institute of Metals is an international journal and the impact factor of this journal in the last one year itself has jumped to a very high number under the editorship of uh, Professor Murthy. I am Metal News is a bi-monthly publication provided to all the members and I am and TIFEC Government of India body had published a series of strategy come source books on non-ferrous metals and alloys. The National Metallurgist Day is the annual event which is held along with the annual technical meeting of the Institute. NMD is the day when we, when the Institute along with the Ministry of Steel, Government of India recognize the excellent work done by the metallurgical fraternity members in the country. The Institute uh, gives away or through the Institute, the Ministry of Steel gives away these following awards, Lifetime Achievement Award, National Metallurgist Award, Metallurgist of the Year Awards and Young Metallurgist of the Year Awards. At the same time, the winner of the Professor Brahm Prakash Memorial Quiz are also given the awards. This is a national level quiz for students which is held every year. Students of 11th and 12th standard participate in this quiz all the 57 chapters, they hold the, the chapter level memorial quiz and the winner from each chapter are that team is sent for the national level quiz. This is a very popular program of the Institute. The Institute on NMD day also gives various awards that these are Indian Institute of Metals awards. There are uh, I am honors including honorary membership and fellowship, national sustainability awards and best chapter awards apart from several individual awards some of which are listed here. Coming to the Mumbai chapter specifically, Mumbai chapter has is a vibrant chapter it has it's a large chapter classified as a large chapter and it has three pillars members basically come from the department of atomic energy bhaba atomic research center iit mumbai and from several industries which are in and around the mumbai region the chairmanship currently i am the chairman and Professor Indradev Samajdar is the vice chairman. The secretaries also are from these respective organizations at this time. Dr. Raghavendra Tiwari from BRC and Professor Prasad from IIT Bombay. And our treasurer is Dr. D. K. Singh. We start the year with the C. V. Sundaram Memorial Lecture just before the annual general body meeting and look at the various evening lectures which were conducted during the year. Some of these lectures with different organizations, including ASM, NAS, IIT Bombay, etc., And some were organized by the Mumbai chapter itself. But you look at the topics starting from uh, the titanium alloys to aircraft turbine engines to uranium and its scope in the country and in the world, various aspects of it, radiation, effects in materials to corrosion resistance to coatings and thin film solar cell materials. This covers a wide spectrum of topics which were offered to the members of the IM Mumbai chapter. Mumbai chapter also hosted the national council meeting at Mumbai on 2nd of October. Industrial visit is a key part of our activities this year during 1920, in the month of December, our members went to 
the Avarist Canto Cylinder Company at Tarapur, and a national conference was, was organized on rare earths, science, technology, and applications of rare earths. The C.V. Sundara Memorial this year in 2020 will be delivered by Dr. Madan Gopal Krishnan, Director Materials Group. Apart from this C.V. Sundara Memorial lecture, which the Mumbai chapter organizes, Mumbai chapter and Baroda chapter together also organize YM Mehta Memorial Lecture. So one year it is organized by Mumbai chapter and the next year it is organized by the Baroda chapter. So I urge you to become a member of the institute and to become the member you simply have to go to the website which is mentioned here im-india.net and fill up the forms there and you will become a member of the institute. Kindly visit that and be a part of the activities which Mumbai chapter holds and the Indian Institute of Metal holds for its members. Thanks. I thank Indian Institute of Metals, Mumbai chapter for giving me this opportunity to deliver an evening lecture. I recall my previous speakers whose lectures I have attended earlier on similar occasions and it makes me feel proud and privileged this evening. Although periodic table tells us that there are only 118 elements but in nature the scenario becomes complicated as they occur in different form that is solid, liquid, gas or they may occur as cations or anions or some of them may even exhibit multivalent characters. Further, they form clusters. From such wide range of natural options, tracing a particular element is very difficult. However, in certain occasions, man unknowingly used some element and it was discovered much later and its actual uses were learnt even much later. Uranium is one such case and I will be talking on this today. U mathematically symbolizes union, but scientifically as well as politically, it represents the most divisive natural element. In the Stone Age period, our ancestors discovered fire possibly by striking two flint materials such as quartz or natural obsidian glasses against each other and then gradually learned to control it by providing more fuel materials like firewood or even extinguishing it by sprinkling water or putting sand on fire. They could interact with fire safely and successively used it to prepare food or to produce warm conditions. Somewhere down the timeline, our ancestors could use the fire for material synthesis and probably by chance produce glass from metallurgical slags. Although debates still exist to decipher whether there were multiple inventions in glass making or not, but available historical records indicate that the glass making technology was known to Egyptians since late Bronze Age and by mid of the 3rd million BC in Mesopotamia. Since its inception, glass and glass based materials were treated as luxury items. Naturally, with time, the demand for colored glasses grew. Similarly, demand for brown and orange yellow colored glasses porcelain materials also increased one of the earliest evidence of colored glass came from indus valley civilization which was a brown glass ba uh, glass based bead of 1700 bc found at harappa color manipulation schemes were learned by craftsmen through their experiences on uses of different available natural ore resources. Unaware about the actual chemical compositions of these natural resources, craftsmen went on producing a full range of glass colors from colorless glass to the intense opaque and transparent glasses to imitate precious natural minerals like lapis lazuli, turquoise, amethyst, emerald, etc. over space and time. Noted Persian chemist Abu Musa Jabir recorded dozens of such color glass making formula. Among these glasses, 
there were few yellow to green colored glasses which used to glow bright at dark night or even under moonlight in europe these glasses were made using a black rock powder material obtained from silver mines of bohemian area now known as czech republic it was noted that the craftsmen associated with such yellow to green colored glasses suffered from some unknown diseases but still others continued to con uh, produce this because of the very high demand of jewelries made out of this material martin henrich klaperth who is credited with the discovery of cerium titanium strontium and tellurium started working with the black rock powder material from bohemian silver ore mines klaperth completely changed the face of mineralogy during his time his systematic analytical chemistry approach was well known around that time he invented gravimetric analysis method and also introduced the possible ways of contamination in analytical chemistry klaporth worked on indian zircons from andhra pradesh discovered zirconium and determined the composition to be zrsio4 he was also co discoverer of chromium beryllium and yttrium klaporth identified uranium first in mineral torbernite copper uranium phosphate but did most of his research with the mineral pitch blend that is uranium oxide he dissolved the ore in nitric acid and potash and obtained greenish yellow precipitate interestingly when he had an extra amount of potash the yellow precipitate got dissolved finally he could separate some rasherous black powder which he thought to be new metal and named it uranium after the newly discovered planet uranus Jeff Arvetson studied the same material and reduced dark uranium oxide with hydrogen and obtained brown colored lower oxide U3O8 which he also mistakenly identified as metallic uranium finally it was Eugene Pelizio who successfully extracted metallic uranium powder following this Henry Moesan who received Nobel prize earlier for discovery of fluorine produced uranium ingot using carbon arc furnace capable of heating a charge of oxide and carbon to the high temperature required to produce metal under atmospheric pressure uranium is a naturally occurring very dense metallic element it forms large highly charged ions and does not easily fit into the crystal structure of the common rock forming minerals accordingly as an incompatible element it is amongst last elements to crystallize from cooling magmas and one of the first to enter the liquid on melting uranium metal is about 60% denser than lead and almost as dense as gold uranium is a radioactive element and spontaneously decays into daughter elements at a unique and constant decay rate when some scientists were engaged in extracting pure elements where others were busy in understanding the mineral structures holding it one good example is naturally occurring black colored material from which john gadolin extracted yttrium with the help of matron klaporth the material possesses conchoidal fracture and isotopic properties both indicating its glassy nature the material was later named as gadolinite jacob bergelius worked on this material and described a special property of it called pyrognomic behavior which upon heating exhibited sudden glowing followed by shattering waldmer broger used the term metamict for this class of naturally occurring amorphous materials and speculated that metamictization was due to outside influences recently we could get one such amorphous uh, gadolinite sample from Kara, uh, to putti south india and establish a structural recovery with thermal inter input to monoclinic structure zaps and zan study show under metamic condition both iron and yttrium occur in disordered polyhedra with thermal recovery iron oxide octahedral gets better organized than yttrium oxide polyhedral it was also noted uranium remains locked with iron yttrium oxygen silicon linkages than silicon oxygen silicon linkages 
Structural study of metamic minerals got great boost from the discovery of X-rays by William Rongen, for which he got Nobel Prize. The discovery was discussed in French Academy of Science, where the possibility of its origin linked with fluorescence was indicated. Henry Becquerel, who was present in that meeting, took the idea and started working on his collection of uranium-bearing minerals and noted exposure of photographic films from potassium uranyl salts under absence of any sunlight and thus spontaneous radioactivity concept was discovered. Initially, Becquerel exposed potassium uranyl sulfate to sunlight and then placed it on photographic plates wrapped in black paper X-rays. Like other days on 26-27 February 1896, Becquerel decided to carry out his experiment, but those days it was overcast in Paris and Becquerel thought his experiments had failed. But for some reason, Becquerel decided to develop his photographic plates anyway. To his surprise, the images were strong and clear, proving that uranium emitted uh, radiation without any external source of energy, such as sun. This attracted Marie Curie and she decided to study spontaneous radioactivity from natural minerals such as pitchblende, torbernite, atunite, monazite, thorite, orangeite, fargusonite. All these one can find within the book named History of Natural Radioactivity edited by H.G. Schubel, which was released in 1996 to commemorate 100 years of discovery of X-rays. Mary Curie, using fractional crystallization technique, could increasingly separate radioactive species. She noted that radiation intensity within unprocessed uranium ore was always greater than increasing amount of purified uranium and concluded that there must be an additional source of radioactivity within the ore. For her experiment, Mary Curie actually measured the conductance of air under the influence of uranium rays discovered by Henry Becquerel. She employed a parallel pl plate condenser of which one plate was uniformly covered with uranium or powder sample. A potential difference of 100 volts used to be established uh, between the plates and the absolute value of the current which traversed the condenser was measured by means of an electrometer and a piezoelectric quartz. She noted that pitch blend of Joan Garnstad recorded 83 into 10 to the power minus 12 amperes, whereas pitch blend of Jochemius Thal recorded 67 into 10 to the power minus 12 amps. Fargusonite, monazite, xenotime, eschinite recorded much less, that is from 3 to 7 into 10 to the power minus 12 amps. Finally, she discovered polonium, which was 400 times more radioactive than uranium and radium with an activity 900 times greater than uranium. Mary Curie also discovered radioactivity from thorium and reported that thorium oxide possesses higher activity than metallic uranium. Mary Curie, Mary Curie and Henry Becquerel received Nobel Prize for this discovery. Around this time, Ernst Rutherford graduated in geology and chemistry in 1895 from Canterbury College and was naturally attracted to a spontaneous radioactivity phenomenon reported from natural minerals by Becquerel and Curis. Becquerel found that his rays, which were known those days as uranic rays or Becquerel rays, could pass through thick opaque materials and that they could ionize gases so that electrical currents could pass through. He also thought that his rays can be refracted and polarized, similar to light. Rutherford, however, repeated and perfected these experiments. He detected no refraction or polarization. To study absorption of Becquerel rays, Rutherford carried out an interesting experiment where he placed a thin aluminum foil between uranium source and an electroscope detector. He gradually increased the number of foils and determined the radiation intensity through measuring the time required to discharge the electroscope. He found two distinct types of radiation, which he called alpha 
and beta for convenience. Alpha radiation could be absorbed by a few thousand of a centimeter of metal foil, whereas beta radiation could pass through 100 times as much foil before it was absorbed. Shortly thereafter, a third form of radiation named gamma rays was discovered that could penetrate as much as several centimeters of lead. It was also established that alpha and beta particles were electrically charged with opposite signs, whereas gamma rays were free from any electrical charges. With the progress of time, usage of uranium as a vibrant colorant in ancient glass, glazes, porcelains and enamels could be established under ultraviolet light by Geiger counter or by placing the object in contact with high-speed photographic film. Under ultraviolet light, it was noted that compounds containing uranium in the tetravalent state are non-fluorescent while those containing uranium in the hexavalent state such as the uranial ions are fluorescent. However, under certain conditions, fluorescence of uranium unit containing glasses under ultraviolet light could be quenched by the presence of excessive alkali or iron as they converted the fluorescent uranyl unit to, uh, to non-fluorescent uranates. So uranium was widely used in jewelries and decorative objects like Vaseline glass, fist ware ceramics between 1830 to 1940 before the adverse health effects of the radioactivity were understood. Health risk from uranium containing objects was found when many objects were stored in a small area or when acidic or alkaline food were stored in them and consumed in quantity. With the growing demands for uranium containing glasses, all the silver ore mines of Bohemian area started becoming the supplier of raw materials to glass and ceramic industries. It may be mentioned here in 1900 Federist Ernst Don in some experiments found that radium emanates a radioactive gas which was named radium emanation. Later, similar emanations from thorium and actinium were found which were named as thoron and actinon respectively. The danger of high exposure to radon in silver uranium mines has long been known. Dr. George Agricola, a physician from Yakimov, recommended ventilation in mines to avoid such mountain sickness. In 1879, this condition was identified as lung cancer by investigation, investigations of miners from the Schoenberg silver uranium deposit in the Saxony. Rutherford wanted to study natural radioactivity and noted that for thorium ore, the value of radioactivity depends on air flow also. To solve this issue, he collaborated with Frederick Sodi and Sodi identified emanation of thorium vapor which chemically inert, which was chemically inert, just like rare gases. Through rigorous chemical extraction route, Sodi separated thorium containing and thorium lin radioactive fractions from the ore. They referred the thorium lin radioactive fraction as THX. Interestingly, they noted once separated from thorium, the activity was removed in the first moment and it built up again over time. Opposite was the case with radioactive thorium lin fraction, where the radioactivity kept on reducing with progress in time. Rutherford and Sodi correlated the change in radioactivity with time to thorium concentration through exponential equation using a constant term called decay constant. Because of the shorter half-lives in the thorium decay series than uranium decay series, Rutherford and Sodi could complete their experiments. From their experimental observations, Rutherford and Sodi concluded that A. One chemical element is transmuted to another chemical element and B. Radioactive decay must involve changes at atomic level because of the change in chemical properties of the decay products with different half-lives. The duo proposed transformation theory where one radioactive element was transmuted to a new radioactive element 
of different chemical properties and with a different half life and sodi named the chemically identical substances with different half lives as isotopes apparently it became clear to rutherford that helium observed in the radioactive minerals is almost certainly due to its production from the radium and other radioactive substances contained therein if the rate of production of helium from known weights of the different radio elements were experimentally known it should then be possible to determine the age of the mineral barton borden boltwood took this idea forward and analyzed 43 samples of uranium thorium minerals including ashenite alanite carnotite uxenite ferguson-ite, gumatite mackintoshite monazite orangeite samarskite thorianite thorite uraninite uranophone xenotime and found presence of lead in all of them he then ranked all of these minerals collected from different parts of the world according to their stratigraphic age and noted that the lead to uranium ratio was relatively greater in the older boltwood inferred that radioactive series leading from uranium ended with lead which is non radioactive and the ratio of lead to uranium can be used as radiometric clock this is how the concept of uranium thorium lead mineral dating came into being in 1907 boltwood could measure ages from 10 different minerals ranging from 410 million years for a uraninite to 2200 million years from a thorianite now radiometric clock can be viewed as a digital clock where a geological process plays the role of battery which can reset the clock to initial time that is time t equals to 0 in case of radiometric dating minerals resetting is done by loss of lead which is essentially produced through decays of uranium and thorium when a particular mineral contains more lead or less amount of uranium and thorium then it means that the host mineral survived for long if by any geological process lead gets lost from the host mineral then its isotopic clock rests to zero solid state diffusion is one such mechanism through which lead can be lost to external environment especially fluid however with decrease in temperature atomic diffusion becomes sluggish and there comes a temperature below which diffusion of parent and daughter isotopes become negligible and this is known as closure temperature the closure temperature depends on crystal chemistry its size shape and cooling rate of the host and also on the nature of the isotopes and their respective diffusion coefficients zircon monazite are the two common accessory minerals which have their uranium lead isotope closure temperatures above 1000 degree centigrade apatite has closure temperature for the same isotopic system between 450 to 500 degree centigrade below closure temperature lead loss can even take place through fluid assisted dissolution and precipitation if a given geological process can create a specific fluid temperature condition such that a uranium thorium containing phase can get dissolved and again reprecipitated with another chemistry then the previous lead accumulation history can be partially or totally lost obviously the reset age of the newly formed rim will indicate the time of alteration such fluid driven isotope resetting can stop either through recrystallization of precipitating phase and therefore removing all fluid infiltration paths or by changing the temperature composition of the system such that the exchange mechanism became inoperative zircon and monazite are the minerals which can form within magma or during metamorphism of rocks or diagenesis of sedimentary rocks and therefore can record successive geological process over time and space these uranium containing accessory minerals like zircon monazite apatite uraninite thorianite etc when occur as inclusions within common rock forming aluminosilicate minerals like corierite biotite mica chlorite fluorite quartz etc produce tiny aureoles of discoloration in case of colored host minerals or aureoles of intense coloration in case of colorless host mineral as shown here such discrete concentric ring shaped tiny aureoles are known as pleochroic halo 
as they exhibit variation in color with different direction of transmitted polarized light. Based on independent experimental studies in 1907, Jolly and Muge suggested that alpha emissions from radioactive host inclusion was responsible for generation of pleochroic halo. You may find it interesting to note that despite the monazite inclusions being of smaller size compared to zircon, radiation halo surrounding it is relatively better developed. This may be due to higher actinide loading within monazite compared to zircon and therefore stronger alpha radiation of the surrounding cordierite. Frederick Sodi presented his experimental findings through a series of lectures and published a book called The Interpretation of Radium. Here, he mentioned about the availability of huge amount of energy during radioactive changes. H.G. Wells, a noted writer, picked up this idea and wrote a science fiction, World Set Free, where he imagined of a world war using uranium-based hand grenades dropped from planes. This idea was partially taken up in World War I when first time aeroplanes were used in warfare. It may be mentioned here that when HGL Wells gave the idea of nuclear warfare, the concept of nuclear fission was unknown and that it was discovered 24 years later in 1938. In fact, in 1933, Rutherford pronounced the energy produced by the atoms is a very poor kind of thing. Anyone who expects a source of power from the transformation of these atoms is talking moonshine. The first validity of H.G. Wells' imagination came after 31 years from publishing his fiction in the form of very first Trinity atomic bomb test at the Alamogadro test range on July 16, 1945. H.G. Wells' next fiction, Things to Come, was even more disturbing to the intellectuals of the so much so that it made Winston Churchill to write an article titled Shall We All Commit Suicide in Paul Mal Gazette. He imagined that a bomb of the size of an orange can be can destroy a building or many such can blast a township. Jewish Hungarian physicist Leo Sizzler was following H.G. Wells science fictions in one hand and the man-made attempts to split atoms to produce huge amount of energy on the other hand. In 1933, he fled to England and around the same time, British scientists succeeded in splitting the atom for the first time by artificial means. Worried about the increasing accumulation of uranium by Germans, on an evening in September 1933, while waiting at the traffic signal at Russell Square in London, it suddenly appeared in the mind of Sizzler that an element which could split by neutrons and would emit two neutrons when it absorbed one neutron, such an element, if assembled in sufficient large mass, could sustain a nuclear chain reaction. He became immensely afraid with this realization and decided not to patent this idea in order not to make it public. To save the world from the possible misuse of uranium, Leo Sizzler drafted a letter for U.S. President Frank Roosevelt and sent it to, uh, to the President through Albert Einstein. After receiving the note from Einstein, Roosevelt flagged off Manhattan Project under the leadership of Arnico Fermi. And this is how uranium, which used to be associated with pow proud positions of rich and famous, became main reason behind international disagreements. Even today, if any element of the periodic table could be said to be the center of controversies and unrest over its use and over the consequences of its use, uranium would be the obvious choice. The turnaround came under the able leadership of Dr. Homi Jahangir Bhabha, who brought out the importance of uranium for various safe and secure peaceful applications on global scale through the activities of International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA. It may be worth mentioning here that IAEA was established as an autonomous organization under the United Nations in 1957 to transfer knowledge and expertise to IAEA member states in areas such as human health, food, water, industry, and the environment. 
the iia also serves as the global platform for strengthening nuclear security and also ensuring safety from ionizing radiation to man and environment uranium is one of the ubiquitous source of ionizing radiation in and around us like it is found within rice and cereals fish spices milk vegetable and different types of natural rocks such as igneous sedimentary and metamorphic rocks geochemical analysis of rocks show that there are only six elements that is magnesium oxygen calcium iron aluminum and silicon by which 99.1% of earth is constituted all remaining elements occur as trace elements vm goldsmith classified all natural elements in four categories atmosphere those extremely volatile and occur in as gases lithophile those which have a tendency to remain associated with silica rich phase uranium belongs to this category siderophile those having affinity for metallic phases and chalcophile those having affinity for sulfide phases now the obvious question came to the minds of earliest geochemist was how uranium was formed in the universe according to one popular theory it was due to supernova explosion another theory suggested that uranium was formed through merging of neutron stars following this the next question which came into the mind of geochemists was when uranium was formed now considering the present day abundances of uranium 235 and uranium 238 half lives of these isotopes and age of earth about 4.5 billion years it came to be around 6.5 billion years ago considering all isotopes formed in one single stage however if one considers the abundances of silicon and carbon isotopes single stage origin appeared to be very unlikely as calculations suggest that at least 10 separate stellar sources were involved in production of silicon and carbon isotopes as we observe them today after the birth of earth it was essentially a molten mass rotating with high speed which with time the molten mass developed crust mantle outer core and inner core structure and within this structure iron nickel sulfur got segregated within core whereas uranium thorium potassium got accumulated within silica rich rock called granite rhyolite etc the next important question came into the mind of geoscientists that how a rock with 5 ppm can produce an ore body of 2000 ppm under magmatic conditions uranium 4 plus tends to concentrate in residual melts since it cannot be accommodated in major rock forming minerals due to its large ionic size and charge within igneous rock apart from crystallizing uraninite and coffeinite uranium 4 plus substitutes for thorium 4 plus zirconium 4 plus cerium 4 plus and titanium 4 plus in accessory minerals uranium 4 plus also exhibit heterovalent substitution example with a uh, calcium 2 plus niobium 5 plus tantalum 5 plus and rare earth 3 plus from this stage enrichment mostly takes place via hydrosphere the enrichment takes place either by mechanical route like placer formation or by dissolution and precipitation route like in marine and non marine sediments uranium mostly gets transported as hydrous oxide or hydroxides and various complexes in a dense fluid enriched in fluorine chlorine boron phosphate carbon carbonate and silica precipitation of uranium bearing phases took place or takes place essentially under very controlled environment which have important parameters like pressure temperature fugacity of oxygen eh ph etc uranium is mildly oxidal in nature and hence commonly occur as oxides hydroxides silicates phosphates vanadates molybdates carbonates sulfates arsenates and tellurides there are nearly 200 mineral species that contain uranium as a necessary structural constituent the most commonly the most common primary minerals of uranium are uraninite pitch blend coffeinite vanadite and davidite common secondary uranial minerals include autunite torbianite etc uranium in native state as well as sulfides selenides tellurides is not found in nature 
biophilic tendency is also exhibited by uranium it has been reported from organisms and organic compounds such as humus coal petroleum bitumen and thucolite search for uranium ore started in beginning of 20th century there is a brief story behind this mercury and pericuri discovered new element radium in the form of radium chloride in 1898 as i have already mentioned they extracted the radium compound from the residues originated by production of uranium colors in the jokhimab factory later on radium chloride found its use in medicine to produce radon gas which was useful for cancer treatment looking at this prospective small companies in and around uh, that mine started purchasing mine tailing from jokhimab uranium deposit and started isolating radium looking at this in 1904 austrian government nationalized all mines in the jakimov area and stopped exporting raw uranium ore in 1934 the jakimov uranium factory started producing self luminous paints for watches aircraft switches clocks and instrument dials the formation of an austrian monopoly and the strong urge of other countries to have access to radium led to a worldwide search for uranium ores in india the responsibility of uranium exploration is vested with amd it is atomic minerals directorate for exploration and research they carry out survey and different methodologies are related to exploration evaluation and prospecting to identify uranium ore bodies in india. in an unknown terrain uranium ore investigation starts with literature study satellite and airborne remote sensing data interpretation rapid radiometric reconnaissance all leading towards identifying favorable geological environments this is followed by five parallel activities namely airborne gamma ray spectrometric and magnetic surveys contour maps with total gamma counts uranium thorium uranium thorium ratio and uranium potassium ratio on foot or carbon devices radiometric reconnaissance surveys geochemical surveys for soil water and gas aerospace data interpretation and lithomorpho structural analysis all these information help in identifying uranium anomaly location this is followed by six parallel activities namely isorate mapping trenching pitting channel groove sampling shielded probe logging sample assay petrominological studies of uranium minerals geological mapping on 1 is to 10000 to 1 is to 50000 scales ground geophysics and radon survey these scientific data are integrated to delineate mineralized block ore body ore body delineation is done by detailed geological mapping reconnaitry exploratory evaluation evaluation core drilling gamma ray logging sample assays identification of ore minerals in core samples uranium thorium ratios equilibrium disequilibrium studies preliminary leaching studies etc economic evaluation of the ore body is done taking inputs from ore reserve estimate and geostatistical analysis and also from multi elemental analysis for possible by products this stage is followed by feasibility studies exploratory mining and produ- production mine based on such extensive exploration studies worldwide the following types of uranium deposits have been identified unconfirmed related deposits these are formed as a result of geological changes close to major unconformities below the unconformity the rocks are usually reduced deformed faulted or brecciated whereas the overlying younger rock may not be mineralization is believed to occur where hot oxidizing metal bearing fluids migrate through overlying porous rock and encounter reducing condition below the unconformity deposits can be found immediately below across or immediately above the unconformity depending on the specific subtype this category of deposits tend to be found in ancient sedimentary basins where rocks are typically 1600 million years or older deposits grade strain to be relatively high uh, commonly 5000 ppm uranium although they can locally reach 200000 ppm uranium typically the mineralization consists of pitch blend or uraninite together with coffeeinite and other minor uranium oxides sandstone hosted deposits the most significant deposits in this category are contained in permeable medium to coarse grained sandstone that are poorly sorted and usually of fluvial or marginal marine origin lacustrine or eolian sandstones 
may also host mineralization. The source of uranium is usually igneous rock. It may be volcanic ash or granite plutons, either close by, interpreted with, or overlying the host sandstones. Mineralization occurs when oxidizing fluids transport the uranium into the sandstone where it is deposited under reducing conditions caused by organic matter, sulfides, hydrocarbons, ferromagnesian minerals. There are four main types of sandstone deposits, roll font, crescent shaped bodies that cross cut sandstone beddings, tabular, these are irregular elongated lenses within reduced sediments, basalt channel, these are elongated or ribbon like bodies that occur along former watercourse, tectonic or lithologic, these are adjacent to permeable fault zones. The host sandstones can be of any age and deposit grades are generally in the range of 400 to 4000 ppm uranium. The oxidized part of the deposits usually contain uraninite or coffeeite, but all close to the roll font, other minerals such as carnotite, tuamonite, and uranophen can be found. Hematite breccia complex deposits. The Olympic Dam deposit in South Australia is one of the world's largest uranium deposit and is of this type. Breccias generally occur within relatively stable cont continental areas where extensional tectonics have caused rifting and the formation of gravens. Mineralization occurs due to the presence of nearby granitic or volcanoclastic sediments and possibly also shallow hydrothermal process. Mineralization in these deposits varies widely from the monometallic kiruna type, mostly iron with some phosphorus, to the polymetallic iron oxide copper gold IOCG type. Olympic Dam deposit contains iron, copper, gold, uranium, silver, and rare earth elements all together. Vein deposits, this may this is a collective term for any deposit of uranium that is formed in cracks, bedding planes, fissures, pore spaces, or stock works. Mineralization occurs chiefly through hydrothermal or geothermal activity. The ages of the host rock and the grades of the uranium are highly variable. Most deposits have grades in the range of less than 1000 ppm uranium, although higher grades have also been reported. One mineral are mostly, uh, ore minerals are mostly uraninite, but also branerite and locally coffeeite in shear zones have been reported. Quartz pebble conglomerates, these deposits are believed to have formed before 2200 million years when the atmosphere was less oxidizing than today. Eroded particles from the source rock were deposited in a fluvial environment and buried while the uranium remained in its insoluble form. Alternatively, it has been suggested that rapid basin filling by rivers could have isolated the uranium before oxidation could take place. These deposits tend to be large in volume but low of grade, typically 132,000 ppm uranium. The mineralization comprises mostly uraninite. Deposits related to intrusive rocks. This is a collective ore deposits associated uh, with granites and anatectic rocks, including alkaline intrusions, carbonatites, and pegmatites, which form from the very last part of magma to crystallize. Grades are typically between 60 to 500 ppm uranium, with the mineralization comprising mostly uraninite. In some of these deposits, the uranium is found in refractory minerals such as zircon, pyrochlor, making extraction more difficult. Volcanic or caldera type deposits of this type are located within or near to a volcanic caldera, which is filled by mafic to felsic volcanic complexes and interleaved sediments. Mineralization is typically related to faults or shear zones and may be either magmatic or hydrothermal related. Ore minerals are uh, principally pe uh, peach blend and often associated with molybdenum, other sulfides, fluorine or quartz. Despite deposit grades are typically in the range 200 to 5000 ppm uranium, but the deposits tend to be small in size. Surficial type deposit this group of deposits are tertiary to recent in age up to 65 million years old near surface con concentrations in sediments or soils. Mineralization is associated with deeply weathered uranium rich granites and occurs with secondary cementing mineral most commonly calcrete uh, but also gypsum, ferric oxide or halides. These deposits can occur in valley fill sediments along tertiary drainage channels and in plyar lake sediments. Metasomite deposits of this type are confined to areas of tectonic magmatic activity in Precambrian shields older than 542 million years and are related to alkali metasomatism.
Ore minerals are typically uraninite and bannerite and deposit grades are usually in the range of 500 to 2000 ppm. Using the uranium thorium lead geochronological systematics as described earlier and other age determination techniques, uranium deposits across the world are restricted in five time frames. And these are identified here as group one, group two, group three, group four, and group five. Note that 60% of the global uranium reserves belong to the Precambrian time and 40% to phanerogenic time. In case of India, 90% uranium reserves belong to Precambrian time and 10% is restricted in phanerogenic time. Recent estimates suggest that India, there is about 3.25 lakh tons of uranium oxides resources distributed in 43 deposits across the country, of which the most important ones are metamorphite type from Shingbum shear zone and strata bound carbonate hosted deposit from Tumalapalli. Other major uranium deposits are metasomite type from North Delhi fold belt, sandstone type from Mahadex, granite related from Vima basin, and unconformity related from North Kadapa basin. In India, Uranium mining is done by Uranium Corporation India Limited, which is popularly known as UCIL. The important uranium mining centers include Shingbum Shear Zone, Zarkand, Tumalapalli, South Karappa, Andhra Pradesh, North Karappa Basin, Telangana, Bhima Basin, Karnataka, North Delhi Fold Belt, Rajasthan, and Mahadev Basin, Meghalaya. Like any other mineral resources, uranium is typically mined using open pit technology when the ore is close to the surface and underground mining when it is deeper down. Underground mining requires a high level ventilation to lower the exposure of workers to radon gas. As an alternative to open pit and underground mining, and especially when geological conditions are favorable, groundwater with added chemicals can be pumped through the uranium deposit to dissolve the uranium in what ore. And and this is called in situ leaching operation. By injecting alkaline solutions such as those made with baking soda or alternatively acidic solution into the ore through pipes, miners separate uranium from the ore underground and pump the resulting solution back to the surface to recover uranium. From mines, ore is transported to treatment plants or mills where the uranium is purified and concentrated in the form of yellow cake, either following acid leaching or alkali leaching routes. All these activities also produce significant amount of waste of different grain size and composition which merit proper remediation and rehabilitation. Sand size materials together with waste rocks are either used for backfilling of underground mine or sent to dump yard. Slime which gets generated in the process is sent to tailing ponds constructed using waste rock and other multiple barrier systems. Indian uranium ore deposits have several challenges towards its processing arising from its low grade, small size, complex ore geometry and complicated host rock. As a result, small production out of large quantity of mining and processing of ore takes place leading to higher cost per unit production and large quantity of tailing generation. It may be mentioned here that tailings are the residue left after uranium extraction and other byproducts from a uranium re reprocessing plant. They can be either of sand size or slime fraction. Uranium tailing management has attracted enough interest of public and regulatory bodies in the country, resulting in wide range of research and development studies. Recent tailing ponds are being envisaged with sound design features of embankment system and impermeable artificial liner to prevent any downward movement of effluent. Laboratory studies are being conducted to implement thickened tailings disposal system. Eco restoration with suitable soil capping and vegetation, including species like Typho latifolia, Impomia carnea, and Cynodon dectylon are being done. Efficacy of microbial leaching of tailings and microbial modifiers are also being studied. Leachability characterization of the tailings under different physicochemical environment, studies pertaining to migration of contaminants into the adjoining environment, modification in tailings texture for minimizing dispersal or radon, 
and its progeny are some of the critical areas of research in new telling ponds of the country. Achieving a good quality yellow quake product from low grade uranium ore is quite challenging. Pre concentration by physical separation method followed by chemical leaching route is usually adopted for low grade ore treatment. However, for ores where physically recoverable discrete uranium phase does not exist, whole ore leaching appears to be a more feasible option. The type of leaching acid or alkaline depends on the nature of the host rock and India has mastered all of them indigenously to produce good quality of yellow cake and subsequent pure uranium and uranium based alloy. It always feels good to hold such a material which even in very small amount can contribute immensely in peaceful ways towards various societal applications such as healthcare, agriculture, food, safe drinking water, green nuclear energy and advanced education and research. Uranium is truly never's envy, owner's pride. Namaste.